Uh, good evening, everyone. We are Team Telephants, and we have been working with the partner organization Center for Wildlife Studies in India. And here is our wonderful team of fellows. Next slide, please. And here is our story. First, we will walk you through the user journey of an impacted farmer. Then we will go over our accomplishments with data collection. And finally, we are excited to show you our innovative prototype. So let's take a look at the problem we have at hand. Awesome. Now, meet Farmer Raj, one of many farmers who goes through exactly what we saw in that video. Farmer Raj lives in one of many villages surrounding Bandipur National Park, and he experiences the exhaustion of protecting his crops from elephants at night. Raj and some of his friends have lost their livelihood due to crop and property damage. One of Raj's farmer friends was seriously injured trying to defend his crops from elephants, while another one of Raj's friends witnessed a forest official being forced to violently confront an, ele an elephant near his farmland. While Raj needs to protect his livelihood and feed his family, he also respects wildlife and does not want the elephant to be harmed. Now, Raj is not alone in his struggle. In 2012 alone, there were over 78,000 reports of human wildlife conflict in India, all of whom received a combined total of ex-gratia payments amounting to 5.3 million US dollars, with the majority of payments made for crop and property damage. However, Many who experience losses through these events are left uncompensated due to problems with local bureaucracy and laws surrounding the compensation system. Human wildlife conflict, specifically human elephant conflict is, prevalent, is prevalent in areas near certain Indian nature reserves, such as our region of focus, Bandipur National Park. In this map, we see that each dot represents a human wildlife conflict reported by Wild Save an initiative of our partner organization, CWS, near Bandipur National Park over the course of four years. Now, while Center for Wildlife Studies provides assistance with compensation payments, Rainforest Connection is an organization that has been working very closely with CWS to develop a device that uses machine learning through their software, Arbimon, to identify elephant noises and pinpoint their location in the forest. Now, this brings us to our contributions to solving this problem and our initial how might we question. How might we develop an effective elephant acoustic monitoring and detection system and associated early warning system to reduce human elephant conflict in agricultural and human dominated landscapes surrounding India's protected areas? At the beginning of our prototyping journey, our first objective in helping CWS is to look for databases of Asian elephant sounds in order to train Arbimon's machine learning models. Within a few weeks, we were able to achieve three accomplishments. First, we located three audio scraping algorithms that parses elephant sounds specific to YouTube and SoundCloud. We learned that there were very few reliable resources from these platforms. Second, we found two large trainable, high fidelity sets of African and Asian elephant sounds. We are proud to say that they are currently being trained on Arbimon. Finally, we established connections between CWS and active researchers who are currently working on collecting and labeling Asian elephant sounds. In the first half of our prototyping journey, we met with Topher White and received a personal tutorial on how to use Arbimon, the machine learning platform. Our fellows, James and Mason, interviewed Dr. De Silva. We learned that there, that there have been many attempts at designing an early warning system. The issue is not in the science itself, but the lack of support in the implementation of the science. Oftentimes, implementations are presented without further follow-up and support, and so they fail as a result. We want to do better. We also interviewed Dr. Vijay Krishnan. We learned that elephants are extremely good at picking up patterns and determining whether or not these patterns are harmful or harmless. Our fellows Prajnan Arushi interviewed Sanjay Mohan. 
we learned that ex gratia payments cover only up to 50 to 60% of lost livelihood. At the end of the first half of our prototyping journey, we knew it was time to synthesize our research and act on innovation. And this brings us to our pivot to innovation. So knowing that Rainforest Connection and CWS have been working on detecting the elephant's presence, how can our team work on deterring the elephants in a way that addresses the farmer's dilemma? Firstly, deterring elephants avoids the crop damage and loss of livelihood for farmers, which is a better alternative to after the fact financial compensation. We need to establish a deterrent system that can be placed on and near farmers' property to provide them with greater protection and establish trust in that relationship with farmers. We also need to ensure that our deterrent system does not cause harm to farmers or the elephants, which is of highest priority to our team. This brings us to our new how might we question, which is how might we leverage the early detection sensor system to build a passive deterrent system that farmers can rely on at night to protect against elephant conflicts. So in order to solve this new how might we question, we had a few design principles to keep in mind. Firstly, promoting the safe land sharing between people and wildlife, understanding challenges from the outset, drawing on past technologies and building off of them, simplifying our solution to ensure its longevity and always asking for and understanding the user's perception of wildlife. So this brings us to our solution, which is a solar powered wind torch, torch meaning flashlight. This mimics the presence of humans at night to scare elephants away. So this is the prototype concepts workflow. The RFCX system detects elephants and alerts our system by Bluetooth. This triggers our solar powered wind torch, which simulates beams of light to show human activity and scare the elephants away. We decided to create a device that replicates the motion of a human holding a flashlight in order to reduce elephant habituation by using wind rotated turbine with reflective surface. The device would shine a light from the top arm housing the electronics module and reflect the light into a variable pattern at roughly an adult elephant's eye level. This is the concept for our circuit design, which starts with the solar panel that is used to charge our batteries. These batteries are used to uh, power the Arduino system, which communicates via Bluetooth and then powers the programmable LED light strip. So this is our prototyping process. Initially, we were testing different reflective surfaces to see which would be most effective. Here we're figuring out which height and angle would be most effective to reach an elephant at eye level, at an adult's eye level, because this is the most common elephant that is found in this conflict area. Here we're testing out the code to ensure that we can control the light. So here we have a turn on and turn off button so that we can control the light strip. So here we can see it's turning on and then we can turn it off. We also wanted to make sure that we tested different light combinations to see which one was the brightest. So here we're testing red and blue because previously we tested white and we wanted to see which would be most effective. And here we're making sure that the prototype can be battery powered so that we don't need to have a device on the ground. And here it works very well in powering our light strip. This is our prototype outside when we wanted to test how it would stand. And here we can see it being tested at night. The video quality is a little grainy at night, but we can see that it's really bright. So it's an effective alternative. Our prototype is designed to be easily manufactured, cheap and replaceable. Materials like bamboo can replace PVC pipe and will be readily sourceable. The total cost will be approximately 17 United States dollars. Farmer Raj can benefit from our system since it is waterproof, low cost, and doesn't require technical expertise to deploy. The system can connect with additional devices based on landscape requirements. Um, three of our main concerns include habituation, effectiveness during the day, and reliance on the wind. Since elephants are perceptive, dealing with them habituating to our system after they realize there are no humans present is anticipated as a potential issue. Although daytime conflicts are less frequent, our system is only effective at night, and our prototype's reflective surface requires a breeze to rotate, limiting its effectiveness during still days. Some of our future plans could include 
adding long range radio transceivers to our device that could help establish a mesh network with rainforest connections acoustic monitoring in order to provide more redundancy and a larger effective coverage. We would like to extend our special thanks to all of the people who made this project possible. Firstly, the Fung Institute and the Fung Fellowship, the conservation and tech faculty, Dan, Akash and David, and our point of contact with the Center for Wildlife Studies, Anubhav, whose guidance was invaluable in making this project happen and who was also here since very early his time. We really appreciate his help and support throughout this project. And with all of the people that we were able to discuss and collaborate with to further our understanding, thank you all for your time and attention and we would be happy to take any questions and comments now. Excellent. Um, I think Anubhav is with us today. So Anubhav, feel free to jump in at this point. Hi everyone. Um, so I'd just like to say that, you know, it's been an incredibly interesting and, you know, humbling experience watching all of the presentations across all the teams, um, the amount of, you know, effort, um, thought that's gone into it and the nuanced product designs that have come out is, is just been staggering. So congrats everyone. Um, I can't wait to see some of these products out, you know, open to the public. Um, with the telephones theme, you know, uh, originally I was quite worried um, when we pitched the project, because we were asking the team to address a very real situation um, and deal with a species whose vocalizations hadn't been studied in this landscape before, um, create a technology product, you know, a conservation technology product that was designed to be used by a demographic that was remote, rural, and technologically illiterate. So in that regard, I think they've done an incredible job. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, you know, we would have run a couple of field tests and been able to iterate on some of the product design and really try to narrow down what works in the field. But, you know, the hope is in the next coming months, we actually do get down to that. Uh, that's our next phase is to, as we're working with Rainforest Connection, is to make sure that um, we can build on some of these prototypes get them connected, have a couple deployable in the field. And given how simple it is to deploy and low cost, you know, um, I really think it'll be useful in trying to address and mitigate human wildlife conflict in this landscape. Um, so incredible job team and incredible job, everyone. It's been such a pleasure watching all of this. Great. Uh, thank you, Anubhav. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching the other presentations. I know it's uh, early your time. <laughs> Um, I'm going to open it up to the rest of the class, including our judges and the teaching team to comment or ask any questions at this time. I just, I really want to thank Anupav uh, for being here as well. Uh, I know what you're going through back there and uh, for you to take this time so early in the morning as well is just speaks volumes to what our partners give to this program. Um, so we can't, can't thank you enough. Uh, I was just wondering if the team, excellent job. Excellent job. I, can you go back to the schematic of your prototype just quickly? Um, that went by kind of quick and I would love, maybe could you just do one more? One, yeah, there we go, that's the one, yeah, okay. Um, what, how is this secured? I mean, could an elephant just push it over and it's over and done with? I can answer that question. So we didn't really think about the securement as much because this is meant to be more of a long distance deterrent system. So the hope is that the elephant would see this light flashing from at least 10 to 20 meters away and then that would deter it. Um, but that's definitely something to keep in mind since right now our system is kind of built upon the idea that it would just kind of stick into the ground and just be there. Um, but as we iterate and further the product design, that's definitely something to keep in mind to keep it more stable um, and secure just in case an elephant does come in contact with it. Okay, okay, excellent. I hope you can do some real real world testing. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a question in the chat from Abhishek and essentially he's asking what's the what's keeping from keeping the rotating disc from being powered? Um, so I can, I can, yeah. yeah, I can go ahead and answer that question. So the reason we chose to make uh, the rotating disc wind powered was to increase the randomization of the light. Um, because when we spoke to Dr. Sridhar, who was one of the um, professionals that we consulted, he expressed concern that any sort of regularity in the patterns that um, the elephant notices would uh, cause the elephants to become very easily, they would immediately understand within the span of a few weeks, I believe he said, that this was not a real person. 
Um, that aspect of randomization is something that we can easily achieve through wind. And I think that's why we wanted to stick to having it wind powered rather than it be a fan and also to cut down energy consumption um, as well as just make it an easy setup and replacement. Cause I feel like when we add more aspects of like a motorized um, thing to it to ro rotate the disc, it does get a little more expensive as well. No, those are all great. Um, I appreciate the rationale there. Um, I do imagine though, if, if it was necessary, right, if you needed to like run it on um, non-windy days or still days, um, you can also run probably some kind of randomization algorithm to the motor um, from the Arduino that would randomize the movements of the of the fan. But yeah, thank you for those answers. Appreciate it. And um, yeah, uh, I think, are there any other questions? There's a Actually, lot of comments. You guys got a lot of love in the chat, but yeah. yeah. Akash, we have a, a VIP in the audience um, who knows a thing or two about elephants, although I, I believe he's worked most, mostly with African elephants. But uh, I'd like to give a, a shout out and an opportunity to comment um, to Ted Schmidt uh, from Vulcan, and I think fairly soon the Allen Institute for AI. Uh, Ted, can you say a few words here? Yeah, th thanks, Dan, and I appreciate that introduction. Yeah, we, we are moving to the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence in a, a few months. Um, uh, first of all, I want to say this, I mean, this project in particular, near and dear to my heart, um, I've spent a lot of time, in, in, in Dan, you're right, in, in Africa. I haven't had the pleasure, unfortunately, yet of, of meeting an, uh, an Asian elephant, uh, uh, so I have to, have to make that happen. Um, but the other thing I, I want to say is how exciting it is to see you focusing on uh, human uh, wildlife coexistence. And I like to use the term coexistence rather than conflict, which is a term you often hear. Um, really, it's, it's been neglected in terms of conservation technology uh, far too long. Uh, there's been a, a, an understandable focus on anti-poaching and, and trafficking. But, um, but the focus on uh, solutions to address human wildlife coexistence are desperately needed. Uh, you know, these folks, the, their crops get destroyed. Uh, they get, I've met villagers uh, in Africa who've said, you know, my niece was killed by an elephant. The, those folks are not too excited about having elephants in the environment. I may be, but you know, they're not going to be. So really love that you focus on this problem. Uh, love the cleverness. Um, I couldn't agree more. Elephants are so smart. They uh, figure things out really fast. You have to randomize. You have to try different things. You, you might even think about attaching uh, different scents. They don't, they don't like bees, for instance. You can make buzzing noises, chilies. There are all sorts of deterrents. You might build those in. And then I think it was Dan also mentioned, the uh, asked about securing. Uh, I have seen elephants, I have seen uh, water towers, massive water towers that elephants have pushed over. So they will get in there, they will push these things over. So you do have to protect them. Clever things like putting rocks around, which they don't walk well on big bouldery rocks. Um, you, you think, oh, I need to build a big fence or something. Actually, big rocks that they can't navigate well can, can serve that purpose. So, so that's really important. And by the way, uh, you know, people also, uh, if they find valuable pieces of metal, uh, they, they may walk off with these things too. So you do need to secure it also from people. So just a, a fabulous project and, and um, I could comment a lot more, but uh, just love seeing this work. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Ted. much, Ted. You know, Ted's been a huge proponent and friend of the conservation track from day one and uh, advising us sort of behind the scenes. And it was one of his introductions that, that actually led to this project. Although I don't know if everybody in between knows that, but so thank you, Ted, for actually having this project come about uh, through your support. Really, really glad you're here. And I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Akash. Yeah, um, there was another question in the chat from Yu Yi, um, and it's about the, have you guys thought about light pollution and its effects on local animals like birds? Yeah. Uh, Oh, go ahead, actually, James, go. Okay, so this was actually the aspect I was concerned with when we were first designing this program. So this, it is a real issue for light pollution, especially in these environments that are next to these natural reserve areas. And like uh, uh, you said, um, birds are the most affected species. But the way that we 
try to address that problem was by integrating with the Rainforest Connection System, which once the algorithm is properly trained, should be able to detect elephants in certain areas and through triangulation, we plan to only turn on these wind torches only when elephants are in the area because they are the species that is actually causing the most damage. And we do want to limit that possibility of light pollution's effects on other animals in the environment, whether it be birds or other mammals in the environment. Thank you, James. Um, uh, yeah, we have about a minute or two left. There's a hand raised. Oh, Sam, you have a question. Go ahead, Sam. I do. Just uh, curious, what kind of capital would you be requiring to actually deploy these? I can take that question. So because the cost isn't too high per unit, it's not the most capital intensive. And another way of us viewing this problem was that the government is responsible for paying a lot of ex gratia payments. But if we can institute a solution where it's more preventative measures, that would be a lower capital cost, but also would be more beneficial in the long run, then that would be something that's a lot more beneficial for the area. So a lot of the funds that the government currently has set aside for payments after the fact could be used for implementing this. And in addition, CWS and partners have funding coming from other sources that could be used to implement the solution. Oh, thank you for that.